This is Death in Ice Valley, an original podcast series from the BBC World Service and NRK. I am Marit Higraf from NRK, and along with my BBC colleague Neil McCarthy, we're trying to get to the bottom of the case of the East Old Woman. Episode 6, Spycatcher. Last stop was in Tananger, a small fishing village in the south of Norway. This was the place where a fisherman called Berton Rott saw the Easter woman talking to a naval officer whilst the penguin missile tests were taking place. That's right. He, he recognised her from the police drawings in the newspaper and then he responded to the request to the public to pass on any relevant information to the police. He did that, but he wasn't prepared for what came after he informed the police. His son, Sverrerot, was with him as the family were boarding a train at Stavanger railway station. They were on their way to London for their Christmas holidays in 1970. Whilst waiting for the train, his father was approached by two policemen. Sverre has never gone on the record with this story before. We were all four. The family was gathered there and should go on the train. And um, he uh, left our group and uh, went with his policemen for about 15, 20 minutes, obviously talking with them. And uh, he didn't say much to us. He said it was some policemen. And then we were wondering about this the whole trip we were in London. Did, did he say why they came to the train station? What, what did they want to speak with him about? My father was a man of few words when things should be kept secret, you know. So when we came back, I was informed that he had had this knife and this handgun that he received from them, that they gave him that uh, in the railway station. And he had that all the time we were in London. Really? For protection, yes. Yeah, did he say something? Why? Why did they give him this? Obviously, he was told by some people to keep his mouth shut. Obviously. Because uh, he um, normally didn't like to speak so much about it. But on the other hand, he was okay. angry sometime. He was rather upset about that, uh, why he was not properly informed. Mm -hmm. So himself... He lacked knowledge about the whole situation. So you can imagine, there you are, about to get on a train, you're with your family, the police take you away, give you a gun and a knife and tell you to protect yourself, um, just as you're about to go on holiday. Not that they're going to look out for you and protect you, but you have to look after yourself. And he had no idea who he was supposed to protect himself from. Quite a scary prospect. But whatever he had reported had put him in danger, that's, that's clear. What a different time they lived in as well, the fact the police just give him a gun and a knife, send him on a family holiday, tell him to protect himself, and nobody even checked at customs or on the border whether he had a gun. He got as far as London and brought it back. Well, that's hard to imagine, but obviously it was not those strict security rules by travelling at uh, those times. Maybe that's also the reason why the East Dahl woman could move across borders with different passports and so. Mm. The checks weren't so strictly enforced back then. At least in Western Europe, I'm sure. Maybe in Eastern Europe it was a different matter. Maybe. And how long was your father told he, he would need this gun and this knife? Did he keep it permanently? He had it for many years, but uh, in many ways it was a story we didn't speak so much about. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, impossible for me to say how many years he kept it, but many, many years he kept it. Sometimes I feel he looked behind his shoulder sometimes. That was just a feeling, you know. How did this whole thing affect your father, do you think? You said he, he looked over his shoulder. Was he anxious about something? Yes, he was. He was very much stressed about this case. All the years he, he, um, he would have wanted that the truth came forward, you know. He would have wanted that. It was like a cover-up. 
It was like a layer of protection around this whole question about this lady. The family rot is still in the dark about who was behind any cover-up of the East Old Woman's movements in Tananger. They were never even told who the police were, who took his father away and gave him the weapons. The secret police archives connected his father with the East Old Woman in some way. But were you surprised by this story? Oh yes, definitely. Leaving Tananger that day when... We were there during two years of work on this case. I was, for the first time, quite convinced, I have to admit, that, wow, this is the hard proof that, that she had something to do with espionage. I think we should take Roth's story to Knut Harvik, the, uh, the veteran crime reporter, who covered the story at the time, and see what he has to say about it. It must have been the secret police. They had their own rules, you know, about weapons, because uh, the uniforms were unarmed at that time. But uh, the secret police had their gun. But they must have felt he was in danger in some way. But from whom? If the East Hell woman wasn't alone, the other person could have seen this fisherman and understood that he would go to the police and report. So maybe this number two is the man who killed her later on, because she maybe tried to get off the hook. And here he introduces another idea to the story, that the Eastal woman was not operating alone. She was part of something bigger. We know she was talking to a naval officer, but did she have other accomplices? Eva Neumann, director of Norwegian Social Research, knows more about how spy networks were operating in Norway at the time. Well, the basic thing is you always have an officer to which you report. In the Soviet days, and for that matter for Russia today, you would always have one person working in the embassy, who is known as the resident, which means that uh, he or she would be the uh, ranking intelligence officer. And these people will, of course, have as the key job to maintain relations between themselves and to recruit. And then you would have relations between intelligence services, so that, for example, the uh, Soviet intelligence service, the KGB, would be tightly in cahoot with intelligence services in East Germany, Poland, Bulgaria, etc. One person who can test to that would, for example, be Vladimir Putin, the present leader of of Russia, who was uh, stationed in East Germany for years. And would you get other agents who are just loan agents? That would be the professional spies, those who actually earn their keep. That is their work. You know, they are sort of, should we say, career spies. Right? Then you would have people who would be working for these spies. They would have their networks. Some of those you might have for ideological reasons, and some of them would have been paid. In this country, Arne Treholt and uh, Gunnborg Altung Horvik would be two examples of that, the two most famous spy cases in, in, in Norwegian Cold War history. So if she was a spy for Russia or an Eastern European intelligence agency, it sounds like there would always have been a number two. Note Neumann mentions a spy called Gunvor Galtug Horvik. That's a surname which sounds familiar. Yes, she was actually the cousin of Knut Horvik's father. That was a big scandal because uh, she had been working in the Norwegian embassy in Moscow and let the KGB inside because she was more or less in a honey trap before. He's not just a well-informed crime reporter, but somebody who actually had a spy in the family working for the KGB, the Soviet secret services, in Norway for nearly 30 years. He knows his stuff. I'm totally convinced, absolutely 100% sure. These people are not lying 
this story is true. But some say, no, it cannot be amongst our journalists mm. in, in NIK who are discussing It's more or less like case. a novel. <laughs> Because some say mm, the secret police or any police didn't give him weapons. It doesn't function that way. What yeah. do you think? They have their own rules. They could lie to the press. They can lie to everybody because of the national security. They were allowed to lie. And they were allowed to pass the border of what's wrong and right. They didn't share any, any facts with the colleagues because they were lonely wolves, all of them, all the time. So Roth's story sounds entirely plausible to Horvick. And remember, he had better police contacts than any other journalist at the time. That's right. Now let's get back on the road. There's a key interviewee coming up. The man who caught the spy in Horvick's family. Get ready to hear from a real spy catcher. Yeah, but this is unlike a lot of the other interviews we've been doing. You've been trying a long time to get this interview. I've been trying for two years to interview this person, this man, and it is not easy because he he doesn't give interviews anymore. But we are now on our way. We got permission to come to his home. So from what you've told me, he's something of a, of a living legend uh, from the Cold War period. Who is he? His name is Ernulf Tofte. He's the most famous Norwegian spy hunter, and he's the man behind uh, chasing down the most famous spies in Norway. And was he in Bergen in 1970 on this case, on the case of the Ice Star Woman? Oh yes, we know he was. When we uh, read the files and the documents at the secret police about the case, we found documents with his name on. So it was no doubt he was there. We're in a, a little community of bungalows. It's a pensioner's um, residence. Hi. As the front door to the bungalow opens, a very tall man in his 90s stoops down, holding his cane. It's no exaggeration to say that he has piercing blue eyes. It's a nice area. It's very nice. I'm very pleased to live here. Yes. It's very fine. As Norway's top spy catcher, I can only imagine what it would have been like to have those eyes boring into you during a long interrogation in a small room, especially once he knew he had something on you. Ernulf Tofte had been called to Ice Valley in 1970 to the scene of death along with the head of the murder squad, Rolf Harry Jarman, to give their opinions on whether she was a spy and whether she had been murdered. You'll have to listen closely to this spy catcher's theory. All people who have been connected with the women in Bergen all told us about that she had in her position a can of hairspray that was very big. Whatever she went and whatever she was in the hotel room and she was on the street, always a can of hairspray in her hand. And that can of hairspray was never found. The woman was found about 150, 200 metres from the little lake, close to the foot track, close to the fire. And then Jarman and I had some talks, and our idea was that it wasn't a murder, it was a pure accident, and the accident could easily happened in that way that she had sitting with a fire, had her hairspray beside her, and that uh, hairspray was falling down in the fire, and she should try to pick it up, and then it blew in her face. That was our opinion. It's strange because there are nothing about the hairspray in the police documents, no. in the witness no. interrogations. I don't know if the... A criminal technician told that to the secret police people, I don't know. 
we've always been at a loss to find out what the fuel was that started this fire. And hairspray is incredibly flammable. And if her hair caught fire, if she did have a, a can of hairspray, it would make sense. And if that can exploded, it's a possibility, isn't it? Yes, but I assume there should be some remnants of this bottle of hairspray then. And there were actually no remnants of, of a bottle like this. You know, if it was a big can of hairspray, could it vanish totally? I looked at the, it was about espionage activity, so I couldn't find anything. She hadn't any good maps. She had no notes comparing to kind of espionage. And uh, he thought the scene could have been that she lost her hairspray down in the fire and then it blew up in her face. And in that way, she was killed. I have heard of many cases, intelligence forces killing people. They were using knives, they were using guns, they were using explosives, they were using poison. But I have never heard that any of the services are using burning as a way of taking life of people. So your assessment at the scene of death yeah. is that she hadn't been murdered? Yeah, and we told that to the chief of police in Bergen. We didn't write the report. We told him our opinion. It was no case of murder. It was no connection with espionage as far as I could see. So Toft is pretty convinced that this scene where the Istar woman was found didn't bear any of the hallmarks of a, of a spy murder. Yes, and he's pretty convinced about his theory with the hairspray and, and his thoughts about this woman not being important for the police because she obviously wasn't the case for the police. It's something about the whole thing that makes me think that he knows more than he says. So the death may not have been connected with espionage, but could she have been a spy? Witnesses say that she checked in and hotel registration cards show that she had multiple identities and different passports, which she checked yeah, in at different I, hotels. I heard that later on. I heard that, but uh, I should very much like to have seen that passport. Some illegal she was sending out, and that had always a second Identity, and that was a passport. That I haven't heard about several identities. I have seen it on, on spy cases on, on television. <laughs> or operating in several kind of passport, but, uh, but uh, I think that if she had used it, another identity, it should be only one, I guess. Here's somebody who knows about chasing spies, catching spies, how spies operate. And if he says, well, spies would have one or two identities rather than eight identities that she had, I tend to believe him on that. Yeah, maybe he's right. But then I get curious on who then needs eight identities. Yeah, we've got to look into that further. I just wanted to ask you shortly, the, the, the suitcases... The suitcases, they were actually found just a couple of days mm -hmm. yes. after the yes. body was found. Mm -hmm. So they must have found the suitcases while you were in Bergen. But in they Bergen didn't want to show them. 14 days after they, they, but they never showed us. They never told about it. They didn't tell about no, no, no. that they found no. the suitcases? No. Hmm. It was their case. They grabbed it, I guess. Okay. Mm. So it was a... Uh, it's a bit of competition between police forces in Bergen and from Bergen to Oslo, I guess. I, I, I didn't think about it. I mean, he's obviously a, a master spy catcher and all his instincts told him, well, one, this wasn't a murder and two, this wasn't a spy. I get the impression that they made this decision quite quite quickly after they came to Bergen. It seemed that they they didn't do too much investigation in Bergen or in her belongings, as we say. They didn't 
look into the suitcases. They didn't even know, he says, about suitcases. And that's pretty strange that they can't that easy and quick decide that this is not a spy. Yeah, it seems to it seems to be ruling it out before he's looked at all the evidence. For example, the, the, the code note with her traveling route. He says he didn't know about that before later. It was in the suitcases, of course, but I mean... Would normally be quite interesting for the secret police to know about such a coded route, don't you think? Mm, yeah. But then the other point he raised is there were no images, no drawings, no notes, and that every every spy has those. That's right. You would think that, but uh, a good spy would also memorize all these things. The classic is you get a piece of paper, you memorize it, and you eat it. That's just the way spies operate. so many strange aspects to this case. One of our great discoveries is the DNA profile that we got from the tissue samples. It was a very good profile. But now, what to do with it? The police have checked it with the Interpol databases, criminal databases, and they didn't find anything. So many of our listeners on the Facebook group have been suggesting, well, why not run it through the commercial databases, these much bigger databases which contain people looking for distant relations or ancestors or building up their family tree using DNA and they have their DNA profiles stored there. That might be a much better place to get a match. So why don't we do this? Well, we really like to do this. I mean, of course, it will give us possibilities if we could do that. But it isn't easy for more reasons. It's not like I can take this DNA profile or the tissue samples or the jaw in a suitcase and just walk away and do whatever I want to as a journalist. The material belongs to the Norwegian police and they are in charge and they are deciding what we do with this material. And so far, they are not willing to do that because it is a difficult situation, both both juridically and ethically, to take this DNA profile and compare it in commercial databases. And also because of the resource situation in the police, they, they don't want to put too much resources into this. I suppose it sets a precedent on one side and then there are all sorts of confidentiality issues for the database as well that people don't necessarily want to have their profiles matched in this kind of a case. It goes both ways, actually. I mean, the police don't want to put the profile into the commercial basis, but the commercial basis often also not want that the police go into their databases and compare things. I mean, these databases, as you say, they are containing a lot of profiles from people looking for their relatives or whatever reason. So these people putting their profile into these bases does not necessarily want to be found by the police for something they've done. You know? Yeah, or something their relative has done, or their unknown relative. Another thing hotly debated by people who have taken an interest in the story over the years is where the Easter woman actually came from. Be good to really find out where she came from. Obviously, it's really important for our investigation to try and work that out. We've got her DNA profile. Can that help us determine where she came from? Well, it can't tell us exactly where she's from, but there's something else you can do with an extended DNA analysis, which narrows down the broad geographical area she came from. It's called mitochondrial DNA, and it connects us with all the ancestors on our mother's side. The Norwegian police sent the Easter woman's tissue samples to the University Institute of Innsbruck in Austria. Professor Walter Parson is a world expert on forensic DNA, and now we have him on video link to hear the results of their analysis. It took them weeks. For the Stalin case, it was difficult to analyze, but it gave a successful result. And the result that we obtained with mitochondrial DNA analysis describes a signal 
that comes from Europe. It has a name, it's termed H24, which is a combination of letters and numbers in order to differentiate between those different lineages that we find. And using a global database, we can identify those regions where we are finding this lineage H24 that we find in the remains of the East Island woman. And this is why we can assume that the mother of this individual, the mother of the East Island woman and their four mothers are of European descent. So she's of European descent for sure. There is one more test which can be more specific about geographical origins, but it's rarely used in police forensics and never before used in Norway. Let's go back to the National Criminal Investigation Service, Kripos, in Oslo. And here in the basement we find Knut, chemical expert. You decided to try isotope analysis in the ISIL woman case. Why and what exactly is isotope analysis? Can you tell us that? This is a very old case, the ISIL woman. We don't have any clue from which geographical origin she, she comes from. And one way to try to, f- to figure that out is to go into the body, to put it that way, uh, into different types of e- tissue. You can go to hair, and then you can go to teeth analysis. And, and the remains of, of the ISIL woman was, as we know, her um, jaw. And then at the enamel on the, the teeth, you have something called different elements. Elements are things like sulfur, carbon, iron, and we also find oxygen and strontium in the teeth. We know that what you eat is what you are. When you eat something, crops from the ground, there is an accumulation of different elements in the grains, or from the milk that you drink, or from the water you drink, it's different elements, and those different elements have something that we call isotopes. That means actually that one element have different mass. So different places in Europe have different abundance of of different types of elements and their isotopes. It's really amazing actually, because the things we eat and things we drink, it's being stored as isotopes in the teeth while the teeth are underneath the surface. Mm. while the teeth are being made. And it's still there and can be analyzed almost 50 years after your death. And were you excited by the findings of the isotope analysis with the isotope woman? For us, it was the first time we had done something like this. And secondly, we did not have too high expectations when we started with this work. And we were extremely surprised about how accurate it seems to be and how well we could actually pinpoint some places that she may originate from. So uh, for us, it was really exciting uh, results. So Knut Endre Shosta, the chemistry expert at Kripos, is excited by the findings. And so are we. Isotope results from the teeth had to be sent to an expert in Australia who interpreted them on a map. Listen next time to find out where in Europe the Easter woman most probably came from. We're getting closer. <laughs>